Very good morning and welcome to our part two from the ESG series of webinar. Brings this webinar in collaboration with the consultant Rosefield Energy Tech. Today's main focus topic will be integrating your sustainability practices with three business imperatives, risk, profit maximization, and inclusive growth. Very much correlated with the industries which we are working with and more focus upon it in our today's webinar in context with ESG. Over to you, Kedar. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Anushree, for that uh, brief context setting. And uh, once again, you know, hello and a very good morning and a warm welcome to all the participants and especially to my you know, fellow speaker panelists. So uh, again, on behalf of uh, uh, all of us, and uh, I welcome you to the second webinar in the ESG series. Uh, I believe uh, you must have attended the first webinar, which I think happened exactly a month ago uh, in February. So uh, this webinar, uh, the second webinar in the ESG series uh, is being organized by IRS Business Services and in collaboration with uh, DA Consulting and uh, Rosefield Energy Tech. So while our uh, speakers, you know, will introduce themselves uh, uh, later, uh, just briefly, uh, you know, talking about uh, them, uh, Captain Tapas Muzumdar is an independent director and a sustainability expert. Uh, Mr. Chandramali Balan, who is now a senior advisor, but has held uh, CXO level positions in uh, MNCs and uh, large Indian companies. And Ms. Anushri Joshi Aparajit, who is the global head uh, customer success at Iris Business. Uh, so once again, I think, uh, welcome uh, uh, to the three of you. Uh, myself, I am Kedar Gore. I'm a partner at uh, Rosefield Energy Tech, who is one of the organizers of this uh, webinar. And uh, a quick brief about my company, Rosefield Energy Tech. So at Rosefield Energy Tech, we are a team of experienced professionals uh, from the oil and gas industry. And we advise companies in the areas of energy sustainability with a broad focus on uh, circular economy, which forms a key uh, element of sustainability You know, with the five EPRs that have been rolled out uh, by the government of India. So we work very closely with government agencies like Niti Aayog, CPCB, industry players, including the PSUs, multinational companies and local players uh, to advise on various areas of you know implementing uh, circular economy practices across their businesses. Uh, we also conduct uh, training programs, uh, the latest being uh, a certified training program uh, which which is called uh, sustainability essentials for professionals in circular economy and trade and uh, you know we also bring various stakeholders by organizing various industry conferences uh, across uh, you know oil and gas uh, space uh, coming to uh, you know uh, uh, this particular webinar i think uh, just to recollect uh, our first webinar was titled analysis of industry practices uh, in sustainability reporting for financial and environmental success, which, as I mentioned, uh, happened uh, same time last month, uh, where the speakers are stressed upon the fact that ESG is, you know, not merely a compliance tool which the board has to own, you know, or something that is to be driven top top down. Uh, it is, in fact, and the more people I speak to, and the more I kind of, you know, I'm into this field, I realize that it's a way to live life for everyone, both in their personal as well as corporate journeys, right? So I think you have to live the life of sustainability. Uh, you know, and ESG to be able to, uh, you know, uh, deliver it. Uh, so now this today's uh, webinar, which is the second in the series, uh, followed by a third one, which will come up next month. So this webinar is focusing on integrating the sustainability practices on three key business imperatives, which is risk, profit maximization, and inclusive growth, right? So I think uh, we are moving a step ahead uh, in, in, the, in, in the ESG uh, journey that we have started. So I would now request uh, you know, the panelists to introduce themselves, in beginning with uh, Captain Tapas Muzumdar. So over to you, Captain, uh, for a brief introduction about yourself. Thank you, Kedar, for that. Uh, good morning to everyone. My name is Captain Tapas Muzumdar, and I'm part of uh, DA's sustainability practice. Uh, DA is basically an organization which is into taxation and both domestic uh, India taxation as well as global taxations. We help in uh, do a lot of work rather in the area of mergers, acquisitions, even uh, supporting businesses which uh, 
are coming into India uh, and setting up shop here. Uh, I'm part, like I said, I'm part of the uh, ESG practice of uh, DAA Consulting, qualified sustainability practitioner. Uh, fundamentally, the value proposition or the core area that I look after is building of sustainability practices uh, in organizations and driven by the core value that if companies can see an ROI in investing in their own sustainability practice, there will be investments. If there's investments, there's practice. If there is practice, there is impact. And that is the value proposition that we bring uh, to the table. In the process, we not only just build the practice, set KPIs and do the reporting, but we also do uh, audits for companies, uh, sustainability audits, and help organization prepare for audits as well. So, like for example, if companies are going in for ratings, we help the organization prepare for the assessment of the rating agency, or if the companies are going in for funding and they are going to be evaluated by the promoters or by the investors. So that's that's the work uh, that we do. Uh, I'm an alumni of an MIMS and uh, an ex-serviceman. I've served in the infantry, uh, finished my tenure, joined the civil world, what I thought was more civilized civil world. and. Uh, Eventually, uh, now I contribute more towards. I've been in the HR field for a very long time. Uh, about five years back, moved out of HR into sustainability. And uh, to be very honest, the time when we joined the services is the same field that you have when you work for the sustainability domain. And immensely satisfying and looking forward to doing many more things in this space. What do you get? Yes, thank you so much, <laughs> Captain. Uh, uh, am I okay? There is no echo, right? Super. So thank you so much, Captain, uh, for that introduction. So I would just uh, request uh, Mr. Chandramauli Balan to just uh, introduce uh, himself as well to the uh, audience. Thank you, Kedar. Uh, I'm Chandramauli Balan. Uh, I'm an ex-civil servant, served the government for about five years and then decided to move on to the more civil world, which is the private sector. So I worked for a multinational company, an American multinational company for over 18 years, uh, leading several of their businesses in India and uh, then moved on to running uh, the Bidla Cement as the president of the cement uh, division and which is what I'm going to talk about today in terms of the ESG impact on and the initiatives taken by cement industry. Currently, I'm, uh, I'm a management consultant and I help small and medium enterprises strategize their growth, improve their top line and bottom line as well. Thank you. Thank yes. you for having me as a speaker. Over to you, Kedan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Balan. Uh, look forward to you know hearing uh, you as well. Uh, the last but not the least, uh, Anushri, uh, about just give us a brief uh, introduction to the audience about about you, and then we jump into the discussions right away. Absolutely, thank you, Kedar. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Chandra sir, uh, for introducing yourself, and uh, I'm glad to be part of today's webinar because I come from a rec tech space. Iris is a rec tech company. Uh, we are the only listed company in India in this particular field. I am Anushri. I'm working with Iris uh, since past decade plus, 12 years now. Um, by qualification, I'm a chartered accountant and uh, working in this uh, space as a customer success head, mainly for um, helping the uh, listed companies in their compliance, various compliances. About our company, uh, we have a line of product suits wherein uh, you know we have cloud-based uh, uh, products for compliance basis, uh, whether it is ESG, whether it is your GST, um, we also have applications. So basically, Iris functions in three segments, collect, create, and consume. Data is something which is very important for us. So whether it is collect uh, segment, wherein we closely work with the regulators across the globe. Uh, we have our present across 50 countries. 
And uh, over there, we mainly work with the regulators in implementation of the XBRL and IXBRL mandate. So that is our domain expertise, XBRL and IXBRL mandate. And um, uh, yeah, so collect is that particular segment. In uh, create segment, uh, we allow the issuers, or you can say the filers in the typical you know, industry terms to comply with the uh, specific mandate through our cloud-based offerings. Uh, maybe it iris carbon, maybe sapphire. You must be using iris GST or currently the uh, LMS litigation management system. So these are certain cloud-based platforms which we bring to the table. And in the consume segment, it is the most uh, leveraged uh, segment of ours wherein uh, we utilize the data which is submitted to the regulators through the official APIs. And uh, we derive different dashboards. One such application is in India, it is used as Iris Peridot which consumes the GST APIs. And across the globe, we use Iris iConnect, which uh, brings in the data. Today, I will be showing something uh, regarding Chandrasar's uh, profile. So as he mentioned that he used to work with uh, Birla Cement, I will be using the BRSR principles in uh, showing the iConnect uh, functionalities with the uh, principle one and principle six, mainly with the BRSR leveraging the create uh, space. Thank you. That was my introduction about me and my company. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Anushri. So as you can see, we have a group of extremely experienced, ex uh, you know, uh, experienced professionals, and then a super uh, regulatory tech platform, you know, to kind of back up uh, the expertise that we have. So great, Anushri. Thanks for giving the introduction about Iris as well. So I think without much ado, I think I'll now uh, you know, jump into the uh, this particular oh. webinar. Uh, so, Captain, I have uh, a few uh, questions for you, and we'll be happy to, you know, uh, know your views on that. So, so one is, um, you know, this is the, there is this common, uh, you know, uh, question which people have that besides uh, compliance and audit and reporting tasks, does sustainability, you know, really impact uh, business? Uh, which means uh, can sustainability be a thriving business model or are we force fitting sustainability onto businesses oh, that's 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 one part and uh, second is yes sustainability is in vogue right now and do you see that continuing which means in other words you know is sustainability really sustainable okay so i think uh, i would leave to you in these two questions to to uh, to, Paul, to maybe you know respond to and uh, ponder for the audience so over to you, Captain. Well, there are very pertinent questions, to be very honest. Uh, let me try and answer both of them. Uh, and of course, I, I will take the help of uh, a short presentation as well onto that. OK, answering your first question, Kira, uh, are we force fitting? Probably, yes, we are. Uh, the reason why I say that we are kind of force fitting, because we are currently in a position where we are being uh, forced into, if I may really put it that way, yeah. and we've been forced into complying. Yeah. That's how industry look at, looks at it, right? But uh, yeah. is that the right way to do it? Probably no. I think we're getting into sustainability uh, more for the wrong reasons than the right reasons. And if you really look at it from a government point of view, if the government has to kickstart an activity, tools that it has majorly is legislative. Now, industry is not going to follow it till the time they don't see the benefit of it because we are talking about companies which exist because of profit mode. And that is absolutely the core. So that's absolutely, there's nothing wrong wrong in it. But if the, if the, if the government wants to it start this, how will it do it? So one of the ways and the most favorite way and the easiest way is to make legislations. The moment you make legislations, then people have to, organizations have to comply to the legislations. And that's where, uh, that's why I say that yes, we are, we are being forced into it. But do we really need to be forced in? I think that is the bigger question that we are looking to answer. And the answer probably is no, we don't need to force ourselves to fit in. 
but probably do it for the right reasons. And that's what I'm going to be discussing today to a, to a large extent. So the idea of building a practice is key to this, uh, to, my, to my response to your question. Now, sustainability has always been part of business. Let's be very clear about it. Sustainability has always been part of business. We have always been dealing with environment-related issues, social-related issues, and governance issues, much before we actually see about sustainability. Businesses always looked to be sustainable. So this is something which has always been there. Now, because of climate change, it has come into focus. And more specifically, climate change brought in climate risks. Climate risks started impacting businesses. And so the investor community actually triggered this whole thing in terms of compliance. The famous email that was sent by uh, Mr. Larry Flint, the CEO of BlackRock, in the year 2021 to all the CEOs of, of their portfolio companies, very clearly mentioned that sustainability ESG is going to be the mainstay of assessments. Now, this started a lot of, I mean, it, not exactly started, but it, it, it kind of solidified uh, the trend that was on already in the industry or being evaluated around around ESG. So ESG is here to stay. ESG has been driven by investors and regulators. And by the way, 60 out of the 110 recognized stock exchanges have already implemented ESG rules, regulations. Some are voluntary, some are mandatory, some are transitioning from voluntary to mandatory. So it's not just in India where you are based, but also those countries where you're doing business with, you will have to comply to their sustainability rules and regulations. And there's a 155% increase in the number of legislations that have come up since 2010. So it is here to stay. It is something that is impacting business, but the right reason to do, to engage in sustainability practices is actually for your own business, to make your own business sustainable. That could be the right reason. And many organizations have taken an early lead, if I may really say that, uh, in making their businesses sustainable through ESG. Point in case could be Lego toys. And we discussed this in the last uh, webinar as well. Now, Lego toys was not implementing sustainability strategies because it is the thing to do. It has always been part of their regular business as being a responsible business. And today, if you, if you know Lego Toys, their entire product range is plastic. But they are not in a crisis situation today. Ideally, they should have been, but they are not because the board of Lego Toys way back in the 90s, early 90s, had already taken up measures to replace plastic. They have not, find, they have not found a, a perfect solution to it, but they have had incremental successes already. And when we talk about Lego, well, there are other companies as well, like Haneke, for example, all right? And Unilever, Unilever is probably the best case scenario that how a company of that scale adopted sustainability as a business strategy. And it's a very unique case. I would like to discuss, discuss that today and how they benefited both financially and non-financially. All right, so let's start off with my presentation on that part. So sustainability overall connects with business at three levels. One, it is a risk mitigation tool. Second, it impacts business continuity. It connects with business profitability. And third, 
it handles or it takes into account those who deliver the services. No company delivers on its own, it delivers to stakeholders. So business continuity depends a lot on stakeholders. Sustainability links with them as well. So let's start with it. With your permission, I'll just share my screen. All right, I hope that is visible to everyone. Yes, yes, it is. Okay. So we're going to talk about the three areas where sustainability connects, risk, profit maximization, and inclusive growth. Like I mentioned, there are three areas that sustainability links with. Risk, stakeholder map mapping, and stakeholders, and the profit motive. And as we go through the presentation, I'll quantify exactly these points. But since I started with Unilever, let's understand how did Unilever manage to do all of this. This is Paul Polman. He was the CEO of Unilever from 2009 to 2019. And let's hear him when he talks about his sustainability strategy. Yeah, but before I came and we launched the new Labour Sustainable Living Plan, some very audacious goals to defund the reverse of our business. We are now that uh, at the same time, the issues that we are facing, the issues of uh, food security and climate change, completely are issues that have not been solved at the level that they need to work. And we can take steps against this. Companies like ours, for the reason, need to work with multiple stakeholders. Well, we actually have made the Unilever Sustainable Plan, our strategy. We haven't, it's not a uh, CSR type uh, appendix to it. It's the core of our plan to succeed and double the turnover of the business in doing it in such a way that we contribute to society. Most business operate and say, How can I use society and the environment to be successful? We're saying the opposite. We're saying, How can we contribute to society and the environment to be successful? We've got 50 Pacific planets to match that. We have integrated it now in our R&D program. We are integrating it into our brands. All of our brands are the product of the planet, the culture of social media. Even if people see that uh, this, this business model sets the bar higher, requires bigger limitations to achieve it, more challenging. But if we're able to do that, we have to accelerate growth. So that's right. As joined, a new growth we've been formed, the Sustainable Business Models Group, which is where we're bringing together pioneering companies from different sectors who really, really want to push the boundaries of what's possible in sustainability. What do you think we should be focusing on? What are the practical outcomes you'd like to see from that new group? So what the forum brings in, first and foremost, is this external perspective from the inside companies of ours. This obviously is a level of experience as well. And secondly, um, being able to share it. It is very clear that uh, one plus one is 11 and bringing in other people. Sometimes the buttons down to some different reach you to better and higher up. The forum bringing these coalitions together. Yeah, we have high hopes actually for the project we've been in the middle of South and Sainsbury here in the future where we've taken some future scenarios and the new growth in the UK and looked at what mainstream consumers will be buying and what technology in those worlds. As a way of identifying what in this case you can do the same street to mainstream consumer behaviour. Yeah, and, and we will learn and we'll, we'll make some mistakes, but I think increasingly we're getting a database of what it takes. And it's not one answer. It takes sometimes price or incentive, it takes transparency of information, it takes putting the alternative there, it sometimes takes an incentive. But you need to look at the at the uh, totality of the tools we have to drive this consumer behavior. Very respectful. Most importantly, involve the consumer in that. 
But they're ready for it. I can tell you they're ready for it. And it's not anymore a developed market. It's, it's uh, definitely becoming global. What makes you think they're ready for it? Well, we see it every day. We see it every day. And um, I think technology is driving part of that. And, uh, you see, what, what we are basically trying to do is kind of fun. I say to people that they can bring down the they can bring down the pounds and pounds. So that's Paul Polman talking about how Unilever used sustainability as a business strategy. Let's understand a little bit about Paul Polman. Okay. The the points that he he fundamentally followed during his tenure. One, ask the right question. It is not about my world, it is about our world. So he projected he used the social aspect, the larger picture, to drive Unilever's growth. But he was not just selling products. He was giving a solution. He was finding a solution. He was aligning his products to a solution. <coughs> like he very famously said, most businesses operate and say how I use society and the environment to be successful. We are saying the opposite. How can we contribute to the society and the environment to be successful? It's a fundamental shift in the way we think. Doing the right thing, if it is possible, that's a current trend. But Unilever's point, Paul's point was, do the right thing and make it profitable. So the entire approach that Unilever had was fundamentally different from its competitors. It chose this path to connect with the larger audience and connect with them for their welfare, for their benefit, for the global good. And that's how he aligned. Embed sustainability into the business, except this is a journey for cultural transformation. And at a later point, I will be talking more about this last point. Don't wait for the pull. Don't wait for legislations and so on and so forth to come. Push sustainability out to your customers. Rather than being reactive to it, get proactive. That's what sustainability to Unilever was. Now, Paul talks about sustainability as a strategy. But how exactly did he go about it? He didn't create anything new. He aligned his products. So he drove his products to connect with the larger agenda. And this is how they did it. Unilever is a global company producing hundreds of brands and sales in over 170 countries. Two billion times a day, someone somewhere uses a Unilever brand. Our sustainable growth story begins over 100 years ago. Our founders were businessmen with a social conscience who saw business opportunities in serving unmet social needs. In the Netherlands, Anton Jergens and Samuel van Berg opened the world's first factories to make margarine an affordable and healthy alternative to butter. In the UK, William Lieber opened a factory in Liverpool to produce sunlight, the world's first packaged laundry soap. A few years later, he launched Lifeboy, the world's first health soap. Lifeboy played an important role in preventing disease and promoting hygiene in Victorian Britain, a role it still plays today, but on a much larger scale than that. In the 1960s, he developed the first margarines to help maintain healthy cholesterol levels, well before worries about heart disease became a public concern. In 1995, faced with declining fish stocks from overfishing, we joined forces with WWF to create a Marine Stewardship Council. At the same time, we started our Sustainable Agriculture Initiative. Working with farmers and suppliers, we developed a set of sustainability indicators that became our Sustainable Agriculture Code. In 2004, our ice cream business worked with Greenpeace to develop ice cream freezers using natural refrigerants. In 2007, we launched small and mighty concentrated laundry detergents in Europe. This enables people to wash clothes at lower temperatures, 
reduces packaging and house carbon. 2007 was also the year we committed to sustainably sourcing all the tea that goes into our Lipton and Fuji Tips tea bags by 2015. So far, all the tea bags we sell in Western Europe are 100% Rainforest Alliance certified. In 2008, we became the first large company committed to buying all our farm oil from sustainable sources by 2015. Today, 30% is covered by greenhouse activities. And in 2010, Ben and Jerry's announced that every ingredient that can be fair trade, from nuts to sugar and bananas to cocoa, will be certified by 2013. There are many parts to our sustainable growth story. The Unilever Sustainable Living is the next chapter. And that's how it all started for them. The key thing here is they integrated sustainability in their strategy. They used their products to align it. So products had targets, not just on sales, but on sustainability parameters as well. And that is what that made it very unique. A little bit about Paul Polman. Now, Paul Polman joined Unilever in the year 20, 2009. It was the middle of the financial crisis. In previous years, Unilever stocks had declined more than 35%. Competitors were beginning to pick up pace, gain market share, while Unilever was losing steam. Now, it's very important to understand this. Paul Polman is not an insider. Paul Polman was brought from outside Unilever. Now, Unilever, as an organization, we all know, is a school of leadership. Those who don't success are not successful in becoming the CEO of Unilever become CEOs of other large companies and competitors. It has always been known as a school of leadership. But here was a case where an outsider was brought in to lead, and there was a reason for that. Unilever sales was going down. Their quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth was going down, competitors were picking up, and the existing culture and the existing mechanism was not working. The board of Unilever, in its wisdom, realized that the existing culture, the existing systems of Unilever was not conducive to the market conditions, and Unilever was not able to perform. That was the reason why he was brought in from outside. And when he came in, Paul changed a lot of things. All right, the very first thing, very famously, he had stopped the quarterly reporting and giving guidance to the market. <clears throat> that was the first thing that he did. But eventually, he decided to take a different strategy. Now, the most common strategy in their market at that point in time was cost leadership. So you reduce the cost and increase the sales. This was commonly you know, adopted by most many of the competitors, small and big. But Paul decided the other way around. He decided to use sustainability as their strategy. It was in November 2010 that Unilever announced its sustainable living plan, which is fundamentally the strategy. It had three pointers in it, three goals. They were very audacious goals. Half the environment footprint of Unilever's products to positively impact the health and well-being of 1 billion people and enhance livelihood of millions. <clears throat> All these goals were outward look. And to achieve this, the question was how will sustainability, how will Unilever's products and services, fundamentally products, enable these plans? That is the approach that they took. It was the new business model. And it aims to link business growth with environment impact so that companies can increase in size and it will reduce the total environment footprint across the value chain. So it's not just your customers, your suppliers, upstream, downstream, your network, all of that gets impacted positively. So it was a forward-looking strategy, something which was not tried out earlier. 
growth at any cost is not viable. We have to develop new ways in doing business which increases the positive social benefits arising from Unilever's activities while reducing our environment impact. We want to be sustainable in every sense of the world. That's what they set out to do. Making things right, uh, making the right things profitable, the main approach. Fundamentally, what they did, they helped people change their behavior, to focus on their behavior. They helped transition that. So when Lifebuoy was aligned to hygiene, the focus was to get the community practice hygiene day to day. That was the focus. That was the aim. That was the focus and aim. In the process, their products also sold. Aligning it to the big picture. There's just one example. Same with the toothpaste. When it comes to the strategy, it's profitable volume growth. When you're aligning it to the big picture. Cost leverage plus efficiency and innovation. And they invested a lot in innovation, a lot in marketing. And when they took their targets, this is how they reviewed it. The three big goals on top. And every six months, they would do this review. How far have they reached? This is at a global level. And drive innovation through that, including the assessments of every product. So when product reviews were being done, it was being done in addition, the, the normal performance of the product plus how the products are performing on their sustainability agenda, the sustainability goals. This is how Unilever went ahead and did it. Now the results of it. This is the stock price of Unilever and this is a phase when Paul was in charge. So his strategy took Unilever to that growth, to that level. Even from a revenue point of view, this is the kind of revenue growth that Unilever saw. So fundamentally, Paul was brought in to change the current situation of Unilever which was fundamentally decreasing sales in a market situation which was very, very hostile. So the market environment at that point in time was not conducive for growth. And Unilever was facing the threat. He is a CEO. He was responsible for the PNL. And sustainability was one of the tools that he had in his arsenal to use as a strategy to change things improve the quality of his PNL. And that's exactly what he was successful in doing. Like I said earlier, sustainability links to strong economic performance. There are three areas, risk, stakeholders, and profit model. Let's dig into this a little. Risk. When we talk about risk in sustainability, we talk about ESG risks. To be very honest, I don't think there's anything called ESG risks. I understand business risk. Every business operates in a risk environment. So you have business risks, which are classified under ESNG, and you normally have one more bucket, which is economic. So you identify the risks, classifying them into ESNG, and then look for an risk mitigation plan using your KPIs, using sustainability, using the tools available under the ESG plan. In case of opportunity, now companies limit themselves only to risks. Like Unilever, identify the opportunities as well and include that in addition to the risk mitigation plan on how you're going to maximize on the opportunity as part of your KPIs. 
KPIs are your risk mitigation plan and they are your plan to optimize or maximize on the opportunities that risk brings. That is the first. Then is the stakeholders. Now stakeholders are important to business, we all know. No company delivers on its own. It delivers through stakeholders. For the company to be successful, for the business to continue for the company, stakeholders' performance is important. Now, when we do stakeholder mapping for the company, we don't question where the stakeholder fits into the business. That has already been identified. But we actually do the reverse. We try and understand the stakeholders' challenges, the stakeholders' business. Like, for example, a supplier. We try and understand his challenges and his opportunities and his risks so that we can make a fair assessment on whether he's able to manage it or not. I can give an example out here. For one of the companies that we were doing with the stakeholder mapping, we had identified the payroll service provider who has been with them for 10 years, who has been providing services without fail continuously. When we did the stakeholder mapping, we realized that he's a youngster running the business very well, but unfortunately his cash management was very poor. His daily sales outstanding was close to 120 days. And if you and I understand business well, 120 days is very close to writing off the dues. It is as close as that. And because he was not able to collect, he was picking money from the market. So literally picking up from one place and giving it at the other. This would not succeed. We intimated the company. We suggested you create a backup. So that's, and luckily they did that. So this boy continued to do this payroll, but compliances on payroll was given to another payroll income. So we built, the company built redundancy internet. And four months down the line, we received an email from the head of HR saying the company defaulted. That month, the salaries were released on the 8th, which normally was released on the 5th, but before the 10th, which is the, which is the deadline. And eventual months, they had no problem. They, had, they don't foresee any problems. Till date, the mechanism works. And this is important. It's easy that, okay, once when a service deficiency happens, you can always replace. But in the meantime, it is your business that has got impacted. And it may not be a fault of yours. It could simply be the circumstances under which. So stakeholder mapping is very important to understand where the business continue to will continue, will happen. The predictability of it is that much more. That is the importance of stakeholder mapping. And the next is, of course, the profit model. There is no function in an organization which does not align either to the top line or to the bottom line or both. An organization exists to make profits. So the finance function aligns to the profit motive in a particular way. The human resources does, the procurement does, the admin does, all of them do. If sustainability doesn't align to the profit motive, it will not exist in the company. It will become a nice-to-do activity. So you must align it. And you do that by first creating what we call as a strategy map. Now, what happens in the strategy? We ask a simple question. How can sustainability contribute to the financial objectives of the company? Why financial objectives? Because at the end of the day, companies are evaluated on their finances. So if sustainability is not contributing to it, then there is a challenge. So you start with that and then work it backwards in the how and the what, like what Paul Polman did. If he has to increase the sales, increase his revenue, those are the three objectives that he took and worked around that. His products to it. Work that way, align sustainability to your profit motive, including have a plan on how to integrate it with your work culture that's what is the third topic which we are doing next month on how 
to integrate sustainability into the work culture of companies. So what does it take to build a strong practice? Organizations today focus more on reporting, on the compliance side. But that is a short-term view. To maximize, you focus on practice. I know of companies which report on five different frameworks. And trust me, the outcome is not greatly different because all these five frameworks are still assessing sustainability practice of the company. So if you don't have a strong practice, regardless of which framework you're using or whom you're reporting to, it is going to be null and void because companies are evaluated on the sustainability practice, not reporting. And this trend is already stuck. So let's try and understand practice from a simplistic point of view. I'll explain it in what, how, and the intended impact. So what is sustainability? Well, identify your ESG risks and opportunities. Like I said earlier, identify your ESG risks and opportunities. They are not separate ESG risks. These are those ESG risks which are business risk classified under ESG and economic. Classify them. Now, risk also brings opportunities. So use the opportunities. Have a plan for that. So identify all of these. Have a plan to address it. That's where your scorecard comes in. That's where your KPI is coming. And simple. Act on the plan. That is where your performance comes. Review of your performance comes in. Reporting of your performance comes in. Now, how do you go about it? Well, start with the frameworks. Now, there are so many frameworks to use. You can use a UNGC, you can use BRSR, you can use GRI, SASB, TCFD, Net Zero Standards, CDP, you name it, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. You can use any of these. All these are good frameworks. They're structured. They are logical. And over a period of time, they're simplified. In fact, even if you don't use a particular framework, you want to create a hybrid, go ahead and do that. These are voluntary codes. I take it this a step ahead. Even if you don't use the frameworks, it's fine. As long as you address certain parameters, the four key parameters that you need to address. If you do that, you will pass the muster of investors and regulators at least 70-80%. The balance is on the approach that because different investors and regulators take different approach. So there is a variation. Otherwise, all of them are fundamentally assessing your company's sustainability practice. But very important, write the practitioner scorecard, what we call the practitioner scorecard, but it is fundamentally your KPIs. Write that because that's what talks about how are you going to execute your strategy. The details are in that. If you don't have KPIs, it is fundamentally a wish list, fundamentally a declaration of intent and not a display of actions. Now support your practitioner's scorecard using data frameworks. Let me explain. So if you have a KPI, that KPI has certain metrics. Your data framework supports. Why was that measure taken? Why was that parameter taken? How does that collect data. How is data collected for that KPI? How is it measured? How is it transmitted? How is data manipulated for information? Now, manipulation here is not in the negative sense. Just to give an example, if you are, like every day when you walk into office and walk out, you swipe a card. End of the month, the HR, when they download it, they simply get the employee code, the date, the in time and the out. That's what they will get. It doesn't tell you anything. Data is dumb. It is only when you minus one from the other, you get an information. Hours worked. And that's what you're interested in. So, in fact, many of us very subconsciously ask, want information, but we ask for data. So, information, the manipulation of data to give information on the KPIs is what a data framework is. Now, when you're doing all this, you can always choose so many different types of KPIs. 
Now, what is important to understand when you're writing your KPIs, first write the KPIs from your material map, which where you've identified your risk and opportunities. Otherwise, there is no mitigation plan. Second, from your stakeholder mapping. And third, from your profit model. And when you're doing that, focus on three things. Your KPIs must contribute to the profitability of the business. Second, must contribute to the business continuity. And in equal importance, it must impact the environment positively. This is how you'll be able to sustain, you'll be able to align sustainability function to the risk, to the stakeholder, that's execution, and to the profit motive of the business. So what does it take to build a strong practice? Like I said, there are five pillars. First one is your strategy and your vision. Normally, when companies start off, and I'm generalizing here, when companies start off their practice, it is kind of by auto reaction. Okay, we have to start sustainability. Let's start measuring carbon. Let's start doing things for the environment. But sustainability has E, S, and G. And all of them, all the three of them are equally important. So do not get myopic and only focus on the environment. Environment is equally important, but it's not the only thing. So define what is it that you're looking to achieve out of your sustainability strategy. And that essentially comes from your business goals. So let's say you want to achieve a, a turnaround or, or this year's financial objective is 12% fat. So the question is, how will sustainability enable that? Just as the sales guy would do it, the ops guy would do it, the production guy would do it, all of that. Sustainability must also ask that question. How will it enable that? And from there, take on. So you need to have a strategy, you need to have a vision, and then derive it out of that, come from that point. Second, aligning with the three things, right? So your material map talks about your risk, and opportunities. Company is normally limited only to risk. Next is a stakeholder mapping. The example which I gave you, align yourself with the stakeholder mapping and whatever the key concerns are is part of your risk mitigation plan, which is essentially your KPIs. Take the KPIs. Don't hesitate to take a target. Even if you fail to achieve it, investors prefer organizations like that for a simple reason. The organization wouldn't take a target if it wasn't confident on meeting it. And they are, nobody told you to take a particular target and fail it. You could have always taken a lower target and shown over achievement. Investors are more focused on, is there year-on-year -year progress happening? Because if the engines are warmed up, you will hit the target if not today. That's what they're more interested in. So if you take a target, it is that much more good for the organization. It presents a very confident company. And last but not the least is the stakeholder communication. You need to talk about your sustainability strategy. Trust me, somebody, if, you, if, if organizations feel that people read their 300-page sustainability report, I think they're overestimating things. Everybody reads their respective sections makes a lot of sense when you are communicating whatever tools that you're using it could be a vendor meet it could be an employee town hall it could be emails to your board to your uh, regulators for example all your stakeholders to so the community saying okay these are the touch points these are the kpis which relate to you this is how we are doing and you decide the frequency. You want to do it every month, every week, half, every quarter, every half yearly or annually. But do it minimum once in a year. The more frequently you do it, the more it is better. Now I'm reminded about how a long, long, long time back, there was a worm found in Cadbury chocolates. I don't know how many of you would remember that. 
And when that was found, literally all of us said, you know what? It is a, by mistake. With Cadbury, it doesn't happen. And we were supporting the company. We never stopped giving Cadbury chocolates to our near and dear ones. Yeah, we're a little cautious, but we never stopped. Why? Because Cadbury has always been talking about their value proposition, about the things that they do, about the great things. We knew this is a responsible business. And that saved the day. If it wasn't Cadbury and for some other chocolate brand, it would have hit them severely. And it has hit business severely. Many organizations, there are enough and more cases where just this one thing where you failed to communicate on a consistent basis has impacted the company financially. Build your agenda. There are three things that you need to do when you're building the sustainability agenda. Compliance, strategy, and performance. Focus on these three things. Compliance is a more defensive mode so that you are not brought in bad light and you continue to meet the regulations. And compliance is finite. It is not that the legislations are infinite. It is finite. So find out what are the compliance requirements for your business. Ensure there is somebody responsible to compliance. Have it reviewed at the board level. It will get there. Strategy and performance. Now, when you're doing this, and that's fundamentally a sustainability agenda, the three things which I said, your agenda will eventually serve your business profitability, business continuity, and the environment. So, the three things that I mentioned, you look at it from integrating ESG concentration to drive revenue and cost efficiencies. Focus on governance, that is strategy, compliance, and performance. And third, integrate it in your work culture. This is something that we're going to talk about in detail on how to do about go about it in our third webinar this week. Thank you so much for your time and patience in hearing me out. And okay. So that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you and open for questions. Over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Captain Majumdar, so for uh, helping us understand how we can make uh, sustainability sustainable and some very uh, insightful in examples, starting with Unilever and then running through the matrix of you know risk uh, versus uh, stakeholders versus you know profit. Uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, yes, I think in the meanwhile, if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, happy to take them uh, in the Q and A section, uh, you know, on your uh, screens, on your Zoho screens. Uh, next, I would, you know, like to, uh, you know, uh, engage with uh, Chandra sir here. I think uh, while we heard from Captain Muzundar on, you know, example of Unilever from the FMCG you know, industry and how they used sustainability as a business strategy. I think Chandra sir brings tremendous experience, as he mentioned, in the industrial uh, you know, uh, space, manufacturing space, particularly in cement and engineering. And uh, what I would like to mention here is cement is, is you know, uh, considered as a hard to abate sector, you know, along with steel, petrochemicals, mining, aviation, thermal power generation, because each of these sectors uses carbon as an integral part of the process. You cannot really take out energy, or you know carbon or you know burning uh, you know or generating or using fuel as a part of their manufacturing processes and we all know how important these industries are in our day-to-day -day lives so chandra sir uh, would you help us understand you know what are some of the uh, given the given the fact that these are hard to abate sectors would you help us understand uh, what are some of the sustainable consumption practices that are followed by you know cement industries in india as well as other parts of the world and how it has impacted, you know, profit maximization, you know, in these uh, companies or in these in this industry. So over to you, uh, Chandra sir. Not audible, sir. I think you have to unmute. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Keda, and uh, thank you, Tapas. That was a really enlightening and profound presentation on the ESG and the Unilever example. Was great. Um, 
I take this opportunity to share some of my thoughts on this. Sustainability and sustainable consumption uh, has been an integral part of our culture. I was just thinking through a long time back, you know, we had this tradition, perhaps even now in South of India, that outside our houses, we use the rice floor to, uh, to draw the rangoli, the kolam. And it makes so much sense instead of using a pesticide to use a kolam early in the morning outside your house. One, it prevents the ants from coming into your house. At the same time, you can kind of feed these insects as well. These are things that were thought of long time back. And more recently, I'm, uh, I had this, I'm having this opportunity of consulting a uh, bio-agri firm. No, and which is when I learned that India has about 160 million hectares of arable land, agricultural land. And lo and behold, only 3% of this is actually using organic fertilizers and organic pesticides. 97% has been using the chemical fertilizers for so many years, which has completely deteriorated the soil health in our country. Now, it's high time. It's, a, I, it's an awakening moment for everyone now to move to more sustainable practices. Coming back to cement, which was a question that was asked me, the first word that comes to mind once we talk about cement is pollution, dust, right? And, uh, and I must share this, uh, uh, this opportunity I had of running this cement company and the kind of brilliant things that they've been doing in terms of uh, reducing their carbon footprints and greenhouse gas emissions uh, into the atmosphere. They were really something that I'd like to share with you today. Uh, not many would know people from outside of the cement industry perhaps may not be aware. There are, there are two kinds of cements that we use. The ordinary Portland cement and the porcelainic Portland cement, right? Now, ordinary Portland cement or called as OPC is considered to be uh, the purest form of cement, right? And cement, as you know, is a very, very simple process very profitable on its own. It just requires blasting some limestone, converting it into clinkers, adding some additives, packing it into bags of 50 kgs and selling it in the market. Very simple process, but very, very polluting. Very, very power intensive uh, business uh, manufacturing requires a lot of power. So one of the interesting things that has happened in the recent times is, uh, Parallelly, we had the steel industry and we had the thermal plants, which burn a lot of coal for their heat generation. And the result of the coal burning was a residue called fly ash. A lot of fly ash uh, used to get uh, collected and the power plants were at one point struggling to dispose this fly ash off. And lo and behold, we realized that if we mix fly ash in cement, we actually improve its properties considerably. Okay. And we also uh, save limestone, which is a depleting natural resource. We could also reduce the uh, pollution caused by blasting or uh, mining for those limestones and thereby increase the life of uh, their availability. So this is called the porcelainic Portland cement, PPC, and we could go up to 35% replace limestone with PPC. Now, in one snap, we found solution for two things. A, the thermal power companies found a nice way to dispose of their fly ash, which initially they were paying money to dispose. Now they were having a product to sell and thereby increase their profitability and also get rid of something that was a waste for them. And here the cement companies were equally happy to buy that because fly ash came at a fraction of a limestone cost and they could mix fly ash up to 35% in their cement and still retain all the properties, good properties, in fact, better it. Because fly ash, the spherical nature has, works like a ball bearing and helps you give a very smooth finish for the surfaces. Also, it requires less water. It demands less water for curing. Um, <clears throat> cement usually has a setting time that happens through an exothermic reaction. So in that exothermic reaction, heat and carbon is given out. 
but when we use uh, the PPC cement, so we have a reduced uh, heat, heat hydration. Uh, also, it increases the uh, ultimate strength of cement. It reduces the permeability, so you don't get the cracks. All in all, it was beneficial for both industries that were generating fly ash and consuming fly ash. So this was one great uh, example, and most countries have now moved to making uh, blended cement compulsory, and they don't permit sale of the ordinary Portland cement, which is uh, which is environmentally not so friendly. But coming from that is also the thing um, that the cement companies use a lot of energy. Now, how do we conserve that energy? Now, there are there's been a lot of advancement in technology in terms of making energy efficient kilns that can generate uh, that can um, that can give better output at uh, consuming lower heat. And the most uh, I think a very interesting thing that's happened over here is uh, the waste heat recovery system. So if you ever go to a cement plant and you see the kilns. The kilns are lit up at about 1500 degrees Celsius. So there is a lot of heat inside the kiln and there is also a lot of heat that gets dissipated into the atmosphere, raising the heat levels around the place. Now this technology of waste heat recovery system can help capture that heat and reuse it for uh, various purposes including the boilers for generating further electricity. So they could save as much as about 30% cost of uh, their coal by using a waste heat recovery system. Alternative fuels is the third thing that we could do, right? So in the cement plant that I had the good fortune of heading, we had a wonderful alternative fuel plant which uses, which used all the agri waste, uh, plastics, uh, municipal waste to burn. So this was like again a symbiotic relationship. We were able to get rid of all these wastes and use it productively to generate heat for the kills and uh, thereby reducing the cost for the cement company, getting the municipality to get rid of its waste. And at one point in time, I was uh, mentioning in a, a jovial manner, we literally burnt money in the sense that Reserve Bank of India has always this need to get rid of the soil notes that it collects back from all its uh, customers. So, and they have to safely dispose it off and they identified our plant as one of the places where they could safely dispose it off by using the soil notes as a currency for generating heat because the currency notes have a high gross calorific value which can be used very uh, effectively. So these are some of the energy efficiency measures also that come up. <clears throat> Another very interesting thing I read about is the uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, now, I don't, I'm not too aware of uh, too many cement companies in India doing this, but abroad, there is this new concept where they, there's a possibility, they're exploring the possibility of capturing the carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere and store it underground for, so thereby reducing the carbon footprint into the atmosphere. So that's another very um, interesting method that cement companies employ. Uh, Again, taking a cue from the circular economy practices, you know, there's so much of demolitions uh, uh, that happen or reconstructions that happen because of which there's a lot of concrete that's that's available for reuse. So we could reuse, a lot of cement companies are exposing the reuse of this concrete back into cement by crushing. And again, thereby uh, improving their profitability and reducing the environmental impact. Uh, <clears throat> Then a new concept called green cement production has come in, where again we try to replace limestone, like I said earlier with fly ash, we could also replace it with slag. Now slag is the residue that you get from a steel industry that again goes on to increase the strength of the cement uh, and we can replace limestone to up to about 50%. We could also use calcined clay, which is a good binding material and a nice green cement. Uh, to be used in the process. So uh, basically there are several good things that um, that cement companies are doing and also uh, the certification standards uh, are pretty uh, rigorous where cement companies are concerned. So many of them follow the ISO 14001 and they are also uh, uh, 
get certifications or leadership in energy and uh, environmental uh, designs. So cement companies per force have to be very, very compliant and uh, be very conscious of the ESG practices. And given that business is usually ro located very close to the limestone mines, so it, and those are available in very remote areas, cement companies actually build up a township in the process and a township where they're able to provide employment opportunities for local people there. They have to build their schools and colleges and hospitals around within the campus. So that way, they, there's a lot of inclusive growth that they bring along wherever they uh, establish their plants. So I guess there's a lot more we could do in terms of uh, alternate material. Uh, things are changing significantly in the building construction field as well. But I think cement has made great progress and there's still great opportunity to make more progress in cement. Over to you, Keda. Wow, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chandra. Chandra, sir. That was really, really insightful. I think a lot of uh, technological innovations, uh, you know, have helped. And obviously, the commitment from the uh, cement industry as such, uh, you know, to kind of drive the uh, sustainability uh, practices uh, across the sector. As I, as I said in the beginning, uh, hard to abate sectors. We were also seeing a lot of action. For example, uh, only yesterday we saw uh, Mr. Sindhya inaugurating the first, I think, the green hydrogen plant uh, somewhere in Jindal Stainless, right? So I think a uh, lot of push from the government as well, you know, for, uh, to try various sustainability practices, you know, whether it is like sea fuels, green hydrogen, whether it is uh, biofuels, uh, electric, obviously, is there. There's coal gasification, is another big you know, thing that's that's happening around. So hopefully we'll see a lot of technology, a lot of investment in technology once the, you know, the awareness and the need to implement, you know, ESG practices uh, goes up. Super. So uh, with that, I think, uh, yeah, again, once again, I think uh, just a small reminder to the audience, if you have any uh, questions, uh, either on the uh, part there, uh, which Captain ran us through or, you know, the, uh, brief in the cement industry which uh which chandra Mali balan gave us happy to you know have your questions in the q a section right uh, and with that i think i'll also now invite uh, anushri you know who uh, uh, from iris to just to give a brief uh, talk about uh, uh, their take on sustainability and the, the reg tech platform you know, that uh, kind of helps companies uh, drive the csg practice so anushri uh, if i can have you on the screen yeah um my video has stopped working so i'm so sorry for that but yes i am very much audible i guess uh, yes you are thank yes. you over to you okay thank you thank you kedar uh thank you balan sir and thank you captain uh, for throwing light on the esg matters and the sustainability practices well tapasa you mentioned about the practices or the adoption of esg how it can be taken ahead and you know the specific stalwarts for Unilever and other companies who are going ahead and adopting this ESG practices. For me, more interesting um, part is like adoption and you know evolving yourself into the uh, area of ESG. So when we say evolving into the area of ESG, it definitely comes upon like current industry sector. So today, like you know, uh, Balansa was mentioning about the cement industry. So I'll be picking up the cement industry and uh, we'll be focusing upon the leveraging technology with the help of these industry standards. So what happens is that currently we have from the compliance sector BRSR. This is the reporting which is currently done by, by the companies. I will just share my screen for this to put more meaning for what I'm saying. Just either just let me know if my screen is visible. Mm, yes, uh, can see your screen benefits of uh, digital. Oh. Yes, absolutely. Oh, wait, wait, it just went away. Oh, it's back now. Okay. Okay. So um, what happens when you know, you have adopted the uh, sustainability reporting and uh, you know, you are, you are one of the company who is also going ahead and uh, reporting as per the mandate. Is it benefiting? Is it maximizing your profit? Is it benefiting you in a certain way? Initially, it may not, unless and until you know you have uh, a proper 
uh, disclosure for the same. So when I say disclosure, what happens is that most of the companies go ahead and submit the BRSR, which is a typical template format uh, reporting, which is done. Definitely the conversion is done and it is reported. How can the investors be benefited from it or what are the benefits of digital reporting? So the, there are a few insights on this. The first one is when we are reporting on the ESG uh, scales, you know, uh, along with the technology uh, perspective. So when I say technology perspective in BRSR case, it is the taxonomy or you can say the specific elements which are needed to be reported by each companies. So it improves your disclosure capacities. It improves the benchmarking techniques. So what happens is that I can compare multiple companies on same factors. I'll be showing it to you now in, in a, a couple of minutes. And the third most important benefit is like, you know, if you adopt such kind of disclosures early, you have the highest amount of data, which is, you know, discoverable or searchable. So the transparency is needed. Uh, I was on the point of profit maximization or, you know, apart from the revenues, apart from the profits, one of the most important area in this ESG matter is the green investing. And that definitely happens when, you know, you have such disclosures, which your investors are watching across. So in such matters, what happens is that for peer to peer benchmarking, what we can do is that we can bring down the industries from the certain sector here, like in context to what Balancer was mentioning over here, I have just pulled out a few cement companies and you can see that I can actually compare which company is doing what. So for example, for my principal one, you can see what are the total number of trainings and awareness programs. If that is my interest point to see like, you know, how are they going ahead with. Similarly, uh, as a green investor, I would more focus upon principle six, which gives me all the details about, uh, you know, like how my CO2 emissions are considered or how my waste management is considered. So on those basis also, you can draw the comparison. I'm just flipping my screen to pull out certain live data. I hope you can see my screen. Some Excel you can see. Yeah. Uh... The Excel is visible with uh, with book one Excel is visible. Yeah, absolutely. So here you can see that this is the live data which I have pulled in for principle six for a few of the cement companies, which is ACC, Ultratech, JK Cement and Ambuja. So what I have done is that for principle six, we have many parameters which are listed. Similarly, as an investor, my parameter would be like what are the emissions or what are the CO2 emissions which are, you know, uh, and how are these measured by each of these companies? In this, I can compare, you know, what are the scope one emissions, scope two emissions, and what are the quantitative details of the same? Maybe if this particular information is just submitted as a mandate in a PDF format, I would not be able to draw this, but with the help of XBRL, what happens is that since the data is quantitative, it is appropriately captured. I can leverage this particular data in a more uh, informative manner. In the, in the first part of our introductions, I mentioned about that Iris works in three different space, collect, create, consume. This is the consume division wherein the submitted data is something which I'm consuming to pull out comparison between the peer companies. So when I say peer companies, yes, I have selected an industry and I'm just pulling the data depending on the industry type. So apart from the scope two emissions, scope one emissions, definitely I would def uh, uh, love to see something which is related to, you know, the waste management, how it is done, how much waste was generated by which company during the reporting period. And that is why what happens is that when we uh, adopt the sustainability reporting, apart from the reporting or the CSR, uh, yes, definitely there were the CSR uh, activities which were earlier undertaken by companies. But it, in my opinion, it was on a very small scale with the uh, sustainability reporting, uh, which is being adopted by, you know, benchmarking companies. Um, there is more focus upon how, even though, you know, there are certain things which cannot be avoided, how can these be minimized? The effect of these can be minimized. I can see the waste recovery has been done. 
you know these can be the selling points for me or you can say the usps for me on the basis of green investing so that is wherein you can leverage technology not only for the you know uh, the reporting purposes but also from your investing purposes as there is also a shift of the investors landscape from only the revenue only from the profits to now what my company is actually or what you know my company is uh, doing from the investing perspective so these are certain technological things which we have to uh, take care of when we are going ahead considering the ESG landscape, uh, which has been adopted globally nowadays. So this is the BRSR, but simply if you have any companies which are, you know, listed across the globe and following any other mandate, like uh, it, it may be, you know, be, uh, ESRS and all, even you can draw the comparison once the data is available in the XBRL and IXBRL format. So this is the benefit of uh, digital reporting, wherein you can live uh, compare the data. You can pull in the data once it is submitted. Any questions on this part? I'm happy to take it. Hello. Yeah, yeah, Rishri, we can hear you. Yes. Super. Yeah, so that was my point from the technological perspective that apart from, you know, adopting the uh, sustainability practices, how can you leverage the technology to see uh, where is your invest, uh, investing or where how you are investing in the in the companies which you know uh, benchmarking for. From the practical perspective. Yeah, so, so great honestly, I think uh, thanks for that, uh, you know, quick uh, demo or walk through. Mm -hmm. the tool uh, that is being used right mm -hmm. uh, super so we have a, a, a few questions and yes of course uh, uh, anybody who has any questions uh, on anushree's presentation please feel free to you know drop it in the q and a section right? i think with uh, 7 minutes to go for the uh, session maybe uh, i can see a lot of questions here in the q and a maybe i'll just pick up a few of them and uh, you know uh, ask it ask for our esteemed panelists to you know answer them so i think mean, there's, there's this question on uh, you know how to um, sustain revenue and profit you know in a in a competitive uh, market i believe this question is from a sustainability point of view so any any thoughts uh, captain on you know uh, how do you go about uh, sustaining uh, sustainable profits <laughs> sustainability <laughs> that's a good question firstly um let me try and answer that and let me try and answer that with an example i think that will probably make more sense um i'm referring to um lego toys again now lego toys the entire business like i said is based on plastic and they invested in the early 90s um, a lot in r d so that they can you know, eventually find an answer for plastic to replace that with something which is more sustainable. They have not succeeded fully as yet, but they have had incremental successes. And one such success that they had, and which actually contributes to the revenue uh, and to the profit as well, to the profit essentially. Uh, you know, there are so many good souls who go to our river beds to our sea and ocean beds and clean the oceans and clean the rivers and so on and so forth and i really call them good souls because they really do it with a lot of mind and heart into it so what comes out of that all the plastics especially the pet bottles what happens to them we all know it eventually gets recycled but companies like lego toys buy them and they buy them the money that is is they use to buy that eventually uh, funds these organizations and individuals who are encouraged to go furthermore and 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 clean up furthermore now when they are doing that what do they what does lego toy do with it they they take it on and they recycle it and they create lego bricks 
for the smaller bricks. One liter PET bottle gives them 10 small Lego bricks. So what they have successfully done is use this. Now, so they have catered for the environment part. Very, very clear. They have catered for the environment part. And like I said, uh, it should impact profitability, continuity, and environment, right? So environment is taken care of. Now, of all the Lego bricks that they manufacture, the PET bottles caters to around 10%. Now, 10% of the raw material, if I just put a, uh, just compare it to the overall procurement that the company does, 10% of the raw material is now sourced very, very economically because they are not paying the price that they pay for the plastics or the raw material that they use for building their, uh, for manufacturing their Lego bricks and the Lego toys. But now, 10% of that is much more cheaper. Now, moment, and it's it's a huge number. So the cost of procurement has come down. It impacts the profitability directly. And in a way, they are building the pipeline for business continuity, because if tomorrow this procurement goes down, they are building alternative channels of raw material procurement to make their Lego bricks. This one initiative takes care of all the three, profitability, continuity, and the environment. And it impacts the profitability. So sustainability contributes to their profit motive in this fashion. It's the same approach. And you just need to think through for your respective business. I can give another example here. We wrote a sustainability, we built the sustainability practice of one of the chemical manufacturing companies. and. Uh, they were they're into house cleaning material. So there is a lot of human touch. They also do it for industrial cleaning with the chemicals are used for industrial purposes as well. Now, it was possible for them to actually have a separate line of products, which would be not just procured in a you know through green procurement, but also the use of it and the recycling of it can actually be termed as a sustainable business. They actually have a separate line of products, which is now termed as sustainable products, which are automatically adds on to their top line. And it's, it's selling pretty well because it projects them. It, it is a responsible product. It's far more better to be used. Yeah, it's a little more expensive than the other products, but this is one line of business which earlier did not exist, which now exists. So there are many ways, many ways to do that, and sustainability can contribute. You just need to apply this the model that we just discussed to your respective business and your the your home. Super, super. Thank you so much, uh, Captain. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, we just have a minute, but yeah, just in time to ask the question. So, uh, Balan sir uh, mentioned a lot of practices like you know use of fly ash, uh, then co-processing, uh, the green bricks, etc., green cement, etc. So, how do you see the future, Balan sir, in terms of you know uh, further in improvements, whether they will be revolutionary or incremental, and would it impact? Uh, Somebody asked a very important question, uh, reduction of prices or in, in the cement sector. If you're on mute, you're on mute. Yeah, glad to take that question, uh, Kedar. And uh, yes, uh, the trend is already uh, very visible, perceptible in terms of price reduction. So we started with fly ash and introduced the PPC cement, and then we came up with slag cement. Now slag cement is something, like I said, we use the residue of steel industries and uh, mix that with cement. The slag is mixed with uh, the limestone cement, OPC cement. Uh, that And that mixture can go up to 50%. So while ash is, fire ash is restricted to 35%, the slag mixture can go up to 50% and in some cases even 60%. So you can see the phenomenal reduction in prices that can come by using blended cements as opposed to the ordinary Portland cement. 
And next time you go out shopping for cement, make sure you don't get carried away by ordinary Portland cement being sold as the purest form of cement. In fact, that is a myth. Uh, the blended cements are much more effective and a lot more cheaper. And we are seeing the price reductions and this will continue in the coming times as well, I'm sure. So, and they will find out more alternatives to be blended with the limestone and conserve limestone for the future. Super. So I think both examples of Lego and of cement, uh, I think drive home the point that instead of using uh, virgin resources, if we use, uh, you know, or reuse uh, or you re recycle waste, I think that's definitely going to be good for the environment and also going to be good for the business, right? Because you immediately put a value to waste and uh, you reduce your cost of, uh, I think, procurement, right? Which, which happens, I think, uh, what we're also seeing uh, with the EPRs with most uh, waste streams, right? Not all, but yes, most waste streams. So I think, yes, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Captain and uh, Malan, sir, for those, uh, those you know, very pertinent examples. Yeah, uh, I think we are we now uh, uh, maybe a minute ahead of, I mean, minute beyond our uh, scheduled, uh, you know, closure. So, uh, and, and uh, so should we so there are no more i think uh, questions there so uh, so anushree uh, just want to conclude uh, uh, this uh, since you started <laughs> yes sure why not yes definitely this was extremely insightful uh, part second of our series of webinars and we are coming up with our next webinar in the month of april first week of april and we will keep our audience and the entire you know uh, community of webinar people who are attending over here posted about it you will get to know from our linkedin handle about it about today's webinar um, definitely because the live examples which were shared are so relatable uh, we work in these organizations we do have close relations with these organizations because you know on in our day to day life we quote examples and work towards it so it was extremely uh, useful to know about, you know, how to adopt these practices. And like, you know, Captain mentioned that there are five pillars which can be, you know, uh, help help us in adopting the entire ESG or you can say the sustainability reporting. It is not becoming so difficult as it is, you know, put forward. Definitely, uh, there are uh, teething troubles which every organization will face, but uh, it's worth for, uh, for, the, for the good future or you can say the my my favorite word green investment yes that is something which will definitely uh take us all ahead uh in this uh, landscape of esg thank you everyone for joining us thank you all thank the you. attendees for being with us it was a pleasure to have you your questions also if you have further questions please write to us at uh, uh, you know our website you can drop an email also on our uh, website and we would love to take your questions from there Yes, thank you so much, everyone, and uh, for everyone, including <laughs> panelists and also the attendees. I hope you all have a good day ahead. Yes, thank Bye. you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much.